Right now, we're going to have a special speaker. You may have seen him. He has spoken all over the world. You may have seen him on TV a few times. He's been on TV many times speaking. And now, him and his wife, Karen, they run a ministry called Hope for Liberia. And so I want you guys to give a huge welcome to Joe Amaral. Thank you, man. Got my hands full. Well, good morning. That was pathetic. Good morning. There you are. <laughs> it's great to be back. It's, um, it's been a minute, but I'm glad to be here. And I wasn't going to come on the stage because I was looking at all the flags. And then I saw Portugal was front and center. So then God released me to come up on stage. In case you haven't, you didn't know, I was born in Portugal, okay? So I'm so glad to be here today. And of all the days to show up, um, just innately, I know when there's free food. Uh, as a missionary, you just look for those churches who are willing to feed you. So we're looking forward to, uh, after the service, just to enjoy some foods from around the world. And that's going to be a great time. And uh, today, Karen and I have the privilege just to share a little bit about what we've been doing. And I was here a few years ago, three, four years ago. I forget when it was. And we were doing something completely different. And I'm doing something today that I never dreamed that we would be doing. I never dreamed that at 50, God would call us to leave the comfort and the security of everything we have in this country. You know, the worst thing a missionary can do is say, God, don't send me to Africa. So next time I'm going to pray, God, don't send me to Hawaii. We'll see what happens. <laughs> but... um. You know, today I want to talk about, you know, moments in our lives. And I want to talk about not missing that moment, recognizing that something significant is happening, and then choosing to become uncomfortable. That's my message today. I want you to be as uncomfortable as possible by the end of this message. You see, I could give you a message that you want to hear. I'll get a lot of amens. I might get a nice little bit of applause. The book table will probably do really well. But today I want to tell you what you need to hear. You know, th th this phrase of Jesus has been resonating in, in my heart that we have to start in our Jerusalem. You know, and then we branch out to our, our Judea. And then we go to Samaria. And then some get to go to the ends of the earth. But none is more important than, than the other. We have to be a part of that process. And today I want to talk about saying yes to the uncomfortable. Saying yes to not to the insane, but to that which doesn't always make sense, to that which is counterintuitive sometimes. Now, I want you to think back for a second and just look over your life. Have there been moments where you knew something happened and you knew that you were then forced with a decision? Do I act on it or do I shy away from it? And we've all done both. And I want to talk about the power of not missing the moment because you never know the impact it's going to have on someone else. Let me start with um, a dream I had. I I'm not a big dreamer, like in terms of actual dreaming. I have dreams to change the world, but actual dreams, I, I don't do it. <clears throat> because uh, of my global travels, uh, jet lag has permanently ruined the part of my brain that regulates sleep. No, honestly. I'm on like hardcore prescription medication to knock me out like a horse. And even then I struggle. And it bypasses the sleep part of the REM cycle and you just, you're knocked out unconscious. I slept through a tsunami in Malaysia one time. They were freaking out looking for me, knocking on my door, calling my phone, and I didn't wake up. So I don't dream, I'm just, I'm out for the count. In 1991, I, I remember having a dream. And it was so vivid and we were in Bible school, and we had no money. We just trusted God to go. We sold our home. We left our jobs in the city. We went to Peterborough. And I had this dream that we were traveling in a vehicle on a really, really bumpy road, and it was hot in the car, and there was people in the car. And in the dream, instinctively, I knew that I knew them, but not very well. And so we're going from these wide roads to narrow roads and narrow roads, and then, you know, the trees were slapping the side of the cars. It got more narrow. And then in the dream... We came out to this community, and all these kids came around the vehicle. 
and there were African children. And I don't know what part of Africa it was in the dream, but they were all coming around me and they had their hands out and they were waiting for me to give them something. And I remember in the dream being so disappointed that I had nothing to give. And so I woke up. Had no idea what the dream meant. This is 1991, first year of Bible school, have no idea what God is gonna call us to do. And you kind of tuck it away, but you know it's a moment. God did something in your heart. He was planting a seed. But I would have to wait 28 years. Don't you love waiting? Isn't it awesome, you know, like when you pray and then God says nothing? When you ask him for something and he says, not now? 28 years later, I find myself in Africa, in Liberia. And I'm invited to speak at different conferences and different pastors' meetings, and I'm doing it. And I said to my host, I said, listen, while I'm here, I would love to go into a village in the jungle. Right? That's like the missionary dream, right? Going to a jungle in Africa. And he said, we're going to arrange it. So we get into a car, and I had just met these pastors a couple of days before. So we're going down the road, and the roads in Liberia, you play fast and loose with the term road. By the way, I'm going to show you some pictures. Never complain about the roads in Canada. I mean, never. So we're going down the road, and it's, you know, it's really bumpy, and at times we have to get out of the vehicle because it won't make it up the hill, right, and all this kind of stuff. And the road's getting more and more narrow. And then branches start to hit the side of the car, and just like a, an ignorant Canadian, I didn't remember the dream I had 28 years ago. I'm like, oh, this is kind of cool. And then we get to a village, and all the trees subside, and there's this beautiful little small community with these huts and people sitting under trees and, and big pots of rice boiling on an open fire. And all of a sudden, I hear the, the singing of children. And this horde of children were following our vehicle, and so I put down my window, and they all had their hands on as they were reaching out to me, singing Jehovah. And I'll never forget I'll never forget the day. I'll never forget that moment because when I was there, I knew that a dream had been realized. And so sometimes God starts something and we don't see it at the time, but we need to pay attention to the moment. You ever get like a feeling, I should call this person? And then you don't and then something happens and you regret it? Right, we've all had those times. Well, I want to encourage you this morning to not miss the moment. Let me share with you a couple of moments that I had in my life, and we're going to go back here to 1987. Imagine me, 17 years old, with a rock and roll mullet, thinking I looked amazing. I had just started going to church with my mom, and um, I really wasn't into the youth group that much because... Nobody swore. Uh, the kids weren't drinking. <coughs> they weren't smoking. They, like, listened to their parents. I thought, what am I doing at this church? I came from a totally different background. And so the kids were saying, you know, you got to stop listening to the music you're listening to because I was into uh, things like, you know, uh, Ozzy Osbourne and, and Motley Crue and Van Halen and Judas Priest, all this heavy stuff. And then I get to this youth group, and they said, hey, you should listen to, to Christian music. And they tried giving me an Amy Grant album. <laughs> and Michael W. Smith, now God bless them. But it's hard to go from Motley Crue to Amy Grant. And they said, no, 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 there, there, there's something called Christian metal. I said, there's not Christian metal. Meh, and so I went home. Now, in the late 80s, we had much music, right? And on Thursdays at 4 o'clock, there was something called the Power Hour, Sounds like a Christian revival service, but it's not. <laughs> For one hour, they would play the heaviest music that was available at that time. And back in the 80s, you could, if you missed the show, you missed the show. There was no repeat. No PVR, no pause, nothing. You missed it, you missed it. So I had to be home at 4 o'clock on Thursdays and get into my hour of power. Well, right after these guys told me about this Christian band, I went home and the DJ said, today we have a special treat. We have a Christian metal band. Here is Striper. Anybody remember that band, Striper? 
One guy, two guys, thank you. So Striper, uh, we're in our uh, a heavy metal Christian band, okay? <clears throat> and their logo came on the screen, Isaiah 53, 5, by his stripes we are healed. And I'm like, what? And the video started, and it was really heavy, and I thought, oh, this is as good as all the other bands I listened to. But they were talking about Jesus and the Bible and don't sin, Listen to your parents, don't swear. And they had long, dangling cross earrings, tight leather spandex pants. And I said, oh, I like this. <laughs> I was so excited, I went to, oh boy, I'm going to date myself. I went to a store called Towers. <laughs> right? Before Walmart, Zellers, Byway, consumers distributing, Towers. I just took you back, right? And so, I bought the album. In those days, the album used to have the lyrics printed on the sheets inside. And I remember following along to the lyrics, and they were talking about accepting Christ and not needing drugs to have a good time. They said, you can have God's power in your soul. Let him be the rock that makes you roll. I'm like, oh, that's how you preach. And at 17, at my bedside, I gave my heart to Jesus. That was a moment that was a moment, and you know what? 20 years later, I'm now the band's official pastor. I'm the guy with short hair. <laughs> I kind of stand out a little bit. And so that was, that was a moment when I said yes to Jesus that changed the trajectory of my life. The next moment was... December 8th, 1990, when Karen and I were married, that was a moment. I don't have time to tell you the story of how we met. Let's just say it involves shorts and our knees touching. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> when your knee touches another woman's bare knee, you have to marry her. It's just... <laughs> we'll save that for another time, Sam. I'm so sorry you're here, sweetie. I'm so sorry. But that's a moment, right? And so the next big moment was February 7th, 1995. Our little princess, Caitlin, was born. A few years later, she married this amazing man. We never asked God for a Portuguese son-in-law, but God is so good. <laughs> and that's a moment that changes your life. Two years later, our next moment was our son, Daniel. He's pastoring out in Cape Breton, way out on the eastern part of Canada. But I knew when we had these kids, it was a moment that changed us forever. The next moment is when I went to Israel for the first time. It was actually November 2002, exactly 20 years ago this month. And I was inside the empty tomb of Jesus in this picture. And you're trying to wrap your head around Jesus, the son of the living God, may have been laid in this tomb. And I remember coming out of the tomb, and the way it's done today is you have to kind of step up and grab the door and pull yourself out. And I remember when I touched that door, just thinking for a second, what if Jesus came out this tomb? And, and it had an impact on my life. It touched me in a way that I can't explain and it was a moment that changed me because it just reshifted my whole life to want to understand the biblical, historical, the cultural Jesus. Now, has anybody been to Israel before? Let me see. Okay, how many have not been but would like to go one day? It's been your dream to go, right? Well, now that everything is open and safe, we go every year. If, if that's a dream in your heart and you'd love to go, next October, from the 16th to the 25th, we're going back to Israel. It'll be my 47th trip by then. So if you want to go with somebody who knows what they're doing, I'm okay. The next major moment is when <laughs> the Lord called me at 50 years of age to Africa. In my Facebook feed or my YouTube feed, I forget what it is now, uh, somebody started liking all my posts. And I kept saying, Sam Abel Binse has liked your post. Sam Abel Binse has liked your post. And there was about 30 notifications one morning. 
You know when someone is new, when they start following you, they go back and they like everything you've posted, right? And so Pastor Sam made a comment and he said, um, he said, Joe, we need your teaching in Liberia. And I saw it. And usually when people make comments, I don't comment back because I don't want to start a long conversation, so I just kind of leave it. But I decided to write back and I said, well, maybe one day. But I didn't mean it. <laughs> it's like, you know, when you're at the mall and you see a high school friend you haven't seen in 20 years and you say, we should grab a coffee. You're not going to grab a coffee. It's what you're supposed to say. Pastor Joe, would you come to Liberia? Sure. Maybe one day. Well, he took it as a challenge. Next day, I get a three-page email from him. When are you coming? What's your calendar like? And he said, if you come, we can't afford your flight. We can't afford a hotel. Nobody will buy your books. I'm like, sounds like an amazing opportunity. Let's go. <laughs> but he said something that really touched me. So first of all, here's, here's Liberia. It's this little country in West Africa. We're sandwiched between Sierra Leone, Ivory Coast, and Guinea. And we have 500 miles of coastline there. It's a beautiful, beautiful little place to be. And so when Pastor Sam reached out to me, he said, Joe, it's not that the people of Liberia are stupid. It's that nobody will come and teach. And it broke my heart. And I had a decision to make in that moment. Do I say yes to comfort and stay here? And keep going to wonderful churches like this? Or do I say yes with no money in our pockets? See, I, I had just left 100 Huntley Street. I had the privilege of being a host there for many years. I was a teaching pastor at a, at a large church in central Mississauga. Things were comfortable. And then I prayed a very dangerous prayer. I said, Lord, make me uncomfortable. I said, Lord, give me something that I can't do without you. Don't let it be something where people look and say, oh, yeah, we could see Joe doing that. No, Lord, let it be something so big, something so uncomfortable that people say there's no way Joe did this. Only God could do this. So to make a very long story short, we raised the money on Facebook. See, Facebook can be used for good things. <clears throat> Got on a plane went and ministered, and when I came back home, God had put this deep love and vision in my heart for, for the nation of Liberia. And I said, Lord, we want to build a community. We want to we wanna elevate where they are. We want to give people hope, and so hope for Liberia was born. And we came back, and I decided that we needed to buy a five-acre piece of property on the main land, on the main road, like on the 401 of Liberia. And we were able to purchase this beautiful five-acre property right on the main highway. And we started something called the Community of Hope. And if you have any kind of a, of a driving app, if you type in Community of Hope for Liberia, it'll give you directions. It's a heck of a drive. <laughs> but it's there. And we said, Lord, we want to build a church on this property but we don't know how to do it. And this was in June of 2020. I don't know if COVID hit Ajax. Did it? Okay. And uh, everything, as you know, was canceled. Everything closed. There was no income. There was nothing. It was the worst thing that could have happened to a guy like me who travels for a living and stands up in front of people. Couldn't stand up in front of people. Couldn't travel. And we had sold our home because we said, Lord, we want to have as little of a financial footprint as possible so that we can do more for Liberia. And God spoke to us about building the church, but to fund it ourselves. And there was a big step of faith for us. And so we did it. And so we built just this beautiful little church, nothing, nothing big, nothing fancy, but a place that would be theirs. It wasn't rented. Nobody could take it away. It was secure, right? So we built phase one. And as you can see off to the, to the side there, it's incomplete. And we wanted to finish building the church offices, living space, washrooms, all that kind of stuff. And so we needed some money. 
And we just decided to trust God. And so we, we birthed Li Hope for Liberia on January 1st, uh, 2021. 2020? Yeah, right in the middle of COVID. Great time to start. And um, somebody out of the blue from the UK had seen one of my videos on YouTube. And they sent Karen a generic email and said, we saw Joe's video where he was giving water to those children in that village, and we'd like to talk to you about what you're doing. We'd like to have a Zoom chat. Oh, God bless Zoom. And I said to Karen, I don't want to have a conversation. What if they're weird? Right? Right? I, I'm always honest. Like, you're not going to get the big fancy guy. I'm just honest. I'm like, oh, but what if they're like crazy? She's like, Joe, it's a Zoom chat. If it starts to go off the rails, there's a big red button that says end. <laughs> right? Wisdom. I said, fine, book the meeting. Well, minutes into the meeting, you could tell this was a legit, you know, sincere couple. And they started to ask us questions about the ministry. And they started to talk about, now, this is all going back to saying yes to that moment, that invitation, being willing to be uncomfortable. And they said, what are your plans? I said, well, we want to finish off this community center, but it's going to cost us about $50,000. And they said, oh, we can do that. Five days later, the money was in the bank account. And a few days later, we sent it to Liberia. And look, we finished off. Yeah, let's give God glory. <laughs> and we said, Lord, we want to finish it nice. And so we, we, we've... You have to understand, when you put a roof on a building, it gets people's attention in Liberia. Because everybody from the West comes, we're going to build something, and they put up blocks. But they never finish it, so they drive right by your site. But when you put on a roof, cars start pulling into our, our driveway. Because when you put in a roof, you're going to put in electrical, you're going to put in plumbing, right? You're going to bring power to the site, you're going to dr dr drill a well, you're going to have washrooms. All of a sudden, everybody was stopping in. So we were able to build the, this big, beautiful center. <clears throat> and we said, Lord, we want to bring hope, we want to elevate the place. And so we modeled the inside after the airport in Paris, France. What a beautiful job. Look at that. What a beautiful job. And I said, Lord, this is amazing. This is something that only you could do. We don't have the means to do this, but Lord, you are amazing. And so we, we kept in relationship and we kept going. And then I woke up one day and I came down to Karen and I said, Karen, chickens. She's like, what are you on about now? She goes, I said, chickens, we need to buy 500 chickens. She goes, what do you know about chickens? I said, nothing, that's why we should do it. <laughs> because you see, it's not about me, right? God, give me something I can't do without you. I can't raise chickens. I thought you planted them and watered them. I didn't know anything about chickens. So I turned back to Facebook and I said, hey, help us. And so we built this huge chicken coop that could house 500 chickens. And a few weeks later, I was on a plane, and look, the chickens came. <laughs> Sam, everywhere I go, I'm surrounded by chicks. Look at that. <laughs> That's a good joke. <laughs> it was so much fun to watch these chickens grow. And there's something about walking into a pen where 500 chickens are chirping. It's life. It's life. And just as I happened to be there on one trip, and their first egg was laid. And by the end of the week, we had all those cartons, and now we're just... Come on, let's give God a little bit of glory. <laughs> Saying yes to that moment, and look how many lives that moment is chasing, changing. There are thousands of eggs going forward, and people are getting protein that otherwise would not. I said, Lord, we need to do something for the next generation that's coming up, right? The hope for the future is the children. We need to educate them, break that cycle of poverty and ignorance. We need to teach and elevate. And so this was the school that we first began working with. Very simple, very, you know, no, nothing, nothing major. And I don't know if you can spot me, Yeah, I know I just blend in, but um, <laughs> a 
Let me show you the inside of the school. And I'm not showing you like a bad school. This is just how all the schools are built. Just dirt floors, bamboo leaves on the side. Very simple, right? Uh, very uh, simple desks and the chalkboard. All the chalk has gone off the chalkboard. So whatever they write on the wall stays on forever. I said, Lord, we want to build a school. We want to build like a real school that's going to elevate this community. Hey, remember that couple in the UK? So let's have a Zoom meeting. <laughs> and so we began to talk. And I said, what do you want to do now? Well, God is putting a vision in our hearts to build a school. And they said, that's awesome. We love schools. We love orphanages. Anything to do with children, that's our hearts. And they said, how much do you need? And I was afraid to ask. It was more than $50,000. It turned out that in 2021, this couple who I've never met, still to this day, have never met them. In 2021, they donated over $360,000. God, give me something I can't do without you. And we built this beautiful school. Isn't it awesome? And so now we have the church community center in the front. We have the school in the back. And there's something else going on behind that. If I have time, I'll let you know about it. But we said, Lord, we want again, we want to elevate this place. When they step foot in this, we want them to sense hope. And we finished the interior the same way. Look at that hallway. Isn't that beautiful? This is what God will do if you'll say yes to the moment. And God took it from this, remember this, to this. Isn't that beautiful? The only thing more beautiful than that is when you fill it with children, <laughs> all in matching uniforms. And we have 48 full-time teachers at the school. They're all Liberian trained and educated. We have Liberians helping Liberians. As a missionary, we should be working ourselves out of a job. Not make them more dependent on us, but give them that sense of sustainability. Teach them, show them, instruct them, and then walk away. And that's what we're doing. And we decided that we just couldn't bring them in, but we had to feed the kids. We've got to hold it together. <laughs> they usually eat every other day. They get a cup of rice, and they share that with a family of five. And they're starving. And they're in that classroom, and they're trying to focus on the teacher, but they can't because their little tummies are growling. And I learned that ears work better when the stomach is full. And we said, Lord, help us feed these kids. Lord, we want to give them a warm breakfast and a lunch every day so they can be full and satisfied and focus and actually get educated. And you know what? At a huge cost, we're preparing over 13,000 meals every month for these kids. But you know what? We're doing it every morning and every afternoon. They're getting a warm meal. Look at this girl's face. <laughs> Do you know why she's smiling? Do you know why she's smiling? Because she knows she's going to have a bowl like this again tomorrow. She's not worried about anybody coming and taking it because every kid in the school, all 330, have a bowl just like that. And we said, Lord, give us something we can't do without you. And I said, God, we have to get them to school. They live in these rural communities. They don't have shoes, and it's hard for them to, to, to come to the class. Lord, we need a bus. I said, Lord, we need $30,000. You asked to buy a bus. Hey, Karen, can you set up a Zoom meeting with that couple in the UK? <laughs> At this point, their attitude changes. They're like, what do you want now? <laughs> I think they were looking to hit the, the red end button. I said, we need a bus to bring them in. We had raised 10,000. We needed 20 more thousand. God bless them. They sent the 20,000, and we got a bus for the school. <laughs> you see what happens when you're willing to be uncomfortable? You know, Liberia, the average person makes $1.25 a day. And during the Ukraine crisis, rice has gone up as high as $50 for a bag of rice. Do you understand the level of hopelessness living in those kinds of conditions? And God, help us make a difference. Help us be your hands and your feet. 
Lord, let us be your heart to these precious people. Well, during the height of COVID and the height of the Ukraine conflict and the shortage of food, we said, Lord, we need to grow our own food. Amen. Yeah. So not only, they call me the chicken pasta. <laughs> we decided that it was time to buy our own farm. So in 11 days, I'm going for my ninth time, and Karen is going for her first time. They've been asking for Mama Karen for years. And we're going to go, and we're going to make sure this farm gets up and running. We need to get seeds in the ground. It's all part of that sustainability. Come on. We were able to get 30 acres. <laughs> and we're going to start growing all the product, all the, the, the crops that you can imagine. We're looking to plant some cassava. Who knows cassava? Yeah, I know you. Caribbeans love cassava. Right, cassava flour. Ooh, cassava sauce with rice. There's food afterwards, right? Did anybody bring some kind of cassava today? One, okay. We're good, okay. We want to plant cassava, sweet potatoes, onions, tomatoes, lettuce, cucumbers, anything you can imagine, fruit trees at the back of the property, mangoes, avocados, everything you can imagine. And we're looking at $10 for every group of seedlings. And maybe there's five people here today who would say, hey, well, we'd love to help you get some seedlings. We'd love to help you get some saplings for trees to literally see fruit grow in Liberia. Maybe there's somebody here today. I have eight minutes and 800 minutes of content. Let's just say God is doing what we couldn't do. We've had the privilege of digging wells across the country. <laughs> to see children play in water, you don't see that. Usually you walk for about 90 minutes to our, our well. I sit on the stairs of our church and I cry. I watch little kids come down off the road, down the little hill, little flip-flops, little buckets, and they, they pump it up and they take it back. 4,000 people come every month to get water from our well. But to see kids playing, and I'm telling you the sounds of heaven, it'll be filled with the giggles of children playing in fresh water. There's something so precious, so beautiful. I'm just gonna go real quick and let you know that we have a, a, a community called FDA with about 100 blind uh, members of, of that community. And we help with food and water, and we bring, we bring them walking canes because there are none in Liberia. Not a single shop sells them. So we pop on to Kijiji. We go on to Amazon, wherever we can go, and we find as many as we can, and we pack our suitcases, and we bring them. And the children just, I took a team of four women. No men would come. Four women came to Liberia with me. And we're able to go into the community and the children touch your heart. And when I go, I'm like a unicorn at the zoo. They all love to gather around me and play with the hairs on my arms and I just let them. The little kid there in the blue, his name is Prince. And his twin sister is Princess. And Prince tugs on my shirt and he says, I want to go to your school because they couldn't go to school because the parents needed them to guide them around town to go beg on the streets. And so we made a deal. Hold that thought, okay? I'm going to come to it real, real quick. Going into the villages is one of my favorite things in the world. At the height of COVID, when we were all freaking out over here, remember that? I was sitting on a floor. I was sitting at a table with whatever it was, taking it, dipping it, eating it, and they were doing it, putting it back in, eating it again. I became Catholic. I became Christian. <laughs> anything, anything. Padros, filos, Spiritus santos, didn't matter what it was. And when I dipped with them, they said, now you're Liberian. They changed my name. They don't call me Pastor Joe. They call me Pastor Kole. Doesn't that sound African? Kole. It means white guy. Okay. <laughs> Honest. Actually, the tribe didn't have a word for white men because they'd never seen one before. 
So they said, oh, your skin is very bright like the sun, so my name is the man with bright skin. So Kole now has the privilege of traveling throughout villages, and we meet hundreds of children, and we bring food and clothing. And on one of the trips, we met this sweet little girl. See her on the left? That's, that's Lopu. She was five when we met her. And God spoke to us about taking her in and bringing her to our school and feeding her and blessing her. And that was taken in September, just two months ago. Look at the difference. Because we said yes to the moment. You have no idea what it means. Oh, we're real quick, real quick. Oh, last trip in September, we received a donation of $12,000 worth of medical supplies. Antibiotics, anti-malaria treatment, high blood pressure, diabetes, everything. And we just received another $6,000 donation to bring on this next trip. Come on, God is good. God is good. This is a team of doctors that went with us. I'm going to have to bypass this next section. And, ah, oh, this is so cool. Google this guy. He is the most feared warlord in the history of Liberia who got radically saved in 1996 by, a, by a, a visitation from Jesus himself who spoke to him in his tribal language. He's the fourth most feared warlord in all of Africa's history. And now he has a ministry where he goes into ghettos. This was a ghetto in a graveyard. People were literally living among the graves. And we go and we rescue them from a life of drugs and crime and we train them and we get them dry and off the drugs and we give them a vocational training. Guys, God is doing so much. We surprised them with 50 mattresses for the kids. That's how you stack a car, guys. None of us doing four trips nonsense. In my last couple of minutes, this is a widow that we helped in one of her darkest times. We rebuilt her roof. We got her a machine to help her make soap products. And now all of her children are in school full time. She is as proud as can be that she needs no help from anybody because we gave her the tools she needed and now she is self-sustaining. Helping this widow Rita has been one of the joys of my life. And just there we are on the right with a bar of soap that she, that she made. We help a group of orphans. <laughs> the guy there on the right, Pastor Beamy, his wife, first wife died giving birth to their last child. It's the number one leading cause of death uh, of women in Liberia is childbirth. One in 10 end in the death of the mom. And so Beamy goes around to village dumps and he finds the babies who have no moms and no dads and he takes them in and we partner together with him. He's up to 33 orphans now. And so I said, Lord, this is, what, this is your heart to care for widows and orphans. And so we decided that we want to do something about it. Now, we don't have that magic button anymore in the UK. <laughs> but maybe there's a magic button in Ajax today. I don't know. But I said, Lord, we want to build a place for the children. And we don't want to call it an orphanage. We want to call it a house. It's a house of hope. We want to bring these children into this home. And when they know when they come to this home, they're home. They're never going to be adopted out. They're never going to be separated from their siblings. And so we're about 25% of the way through it. The foundations are dug. The plumbing and the floor is going in this week as we speak. We have a long way to go. But we're believing God to finish this, this orphanage, this home for children to come. Has anybody seeing the power of saying yes to a moment? Do you understand how many lives right here in your Jerusalem you could impact if you just be willing to say yes? To get uncomfortable and say, God, I will do whatever you want me to do. When we say yes to him, amazing and incredible things can happen. Folks, my, my time is up here, but I hope that in this time together that you've been encouraged to say yes to becoming uncomfortable, saying, God, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'll do it because I want to give you all the glory. I want to make sure nobody will ever look at me and say, wow, look at what you're doing. But God, look at what you're doing through us. And if we're careful to give him the glory, he'll do it. Amen.
Amen. If God has spoken to anybody's heart today and you want to just say this, we want to do something, come to the back. Karen is there. You want to buy a tree. You want to buy a bag of rice. You want to help send a kid to school. Whatever is in your heart to do, go. And if you can't give, pray for us. Sign up for our newsletter. We just send it out every two months. We're not going to bombard your, your inbox or your mailbox or anything like that. And if you signed up today, Karen has a gift back there, either a book or a DVD from some of my teaching from the past that you can take. I just want to thank you, Sam, for the opportunity to share. I know it's been quick, but again, I hope and I pray that you've been motivated today to pray that prayer, God, make me uncomfortable for your kingdom. We have no idea that one person that you will touch, who maybe you're not the one who's going to save 10,000, but maybe they will. Or maybe someone they. So let's say yes to being uncomfortable today and let's see what God will do. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you.